Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for another episode of Two Economists and a Lender, where we take a deep dive into the most important economic issues facing agriculture. I'm your host, Carly Jacobson. Again, we have David Widmar and Brent Loy back here with us from Agricultural Economic Insights, along with our own Grant Dixon, who is out of McCook, Nebraska. So during a time when we could be talking about wars, inflation, interest rates, we're actually intentionally not today. Um, today, we're going to ground ourselves back into the things that we can control and actions that we can take. doesn't mean we don't want to ever talk about those, but today we're going to talk about having a vision for the future and setting goals. So that, and for most of us, that's not really the hard part. In fact, if you're like me, it's breaking down the goals into actionable steps that can really get me into trouble. Even when I do that, sometimes I lack the accountability to make it happen when the going gets tough. So today we're going to look at the tips and tricks for converting goals to plans and ultimately results. So, and with that, Brent, let me kick this over to you to get us started. Thanks, Carly. And thanks for sharing that. It's, uh, it's good to know that I'm not the only one that struggles with uh, getting the goals uh, turned into action all the time. And, and I think a lot of us can relate to that. Let's go ahead and get started on goals to plans. And uh, as Carly said, you know, there's a lot of global events happening right now. And David and I have been doing webinars on these things and uh, are, are up to speed on a lot of that stuff. So if you want to ask those questions, too, you can ask them in the overtime. But in some ways, I think it's a good illustration, as Carly said, is that we tend to sometimes get distracted by things that are outside of our control and, and forget to work on the things that we really can control. And the, the, one of the most important things you can do uh, is prioritizing your efforts. And we all know that we have uh, scarce resources uh, in those two scarce resources for almost all of us are time and capital. And how you decide to allocate your time and your capital are going to have a huge impact on um, how your business goes and, and your personal life and all those other kinds of things, how that evolves over time. And it's really important to stop and think a little bit about how we allocate both of those resources. And I know from my own perspective, uh, the time allocation is probably one of the hardest things um, that we have to do. Are we spending our time wisely and on things that matter? Uh, are, are we always finding ourselves uh, busy and frazzled or, or, or bored, uh, I think is the other um indication about how you're allocating your time, but it's really important to kind of reflect on that. And one of the things we can do uh, to help with that is thinking about our goals and our priorities. And we all know that there's lots of conflicting priority, priorities that we face in our life. There's personal things we have to do, there's things associated with our business, and then we have kind of the issue of, you know, what, what am I going to do today? versus what am I going to get done in a week versus what do I hope to accomplish over, over the year. And I, I firmly believe that we spend some time thinking about how to organize ourselves and our business. Uh, we, can, we can do better at those things. And, and the other thing that setting goals and prioritizing your efforts helps with is it really helps to measure our progress and our success. So if we have some goals of doing accomplishing certain things, we can use those to help measure and determine, hey, are, are we achieving what we hope to achieve? Are we making it to where we want to? And if we're not, um, what are some things we can do to, to modify that? So I think it's useful for all kinds of, all kinds of reasons. Um, now, the, the thing that I think trips a lot of us up is that you know, I think this old quote, uh, and we have a David found someone to attribute this quote to. I thought it was a Chinese proverb or something, but uh, we've all heard it. And uh, a goal without a plan is just a wish. And, and I think that's very true. You know, so we have to have a plan for achieving those goals. But it's really important to start with something, you know, a good goal. And 
you know, I think most of us have heard the old uh, idea of a smart goal. And uh, yeah, it's an old idea, but part of the reason it's an old idea and it's made it this long is it's a pretty good one. And you want to start when you're setting your goals with something that's specific. Is it clear for everybody? And just to give you an example, you say, well, I want to be financially successful. Well, that's not really a very specific goal. It doesn't really say very much. Uh, it's not measurable. How will we know if we achieve it or not? Um, so we want to start with something that's more specific. Like, for instance, you know, I want to achieve a certain level of working capital in my business. Um, that's specific. It's measurable. We can know whether we get there or not. Uh, we want to think and understand, is that goal achievable? And there's, there's a fine line there between setting goals that are uh, stretch goals, goals that make us work. Uh, versus ones that aren't achievable at all versus ones that are they are too easily achieved. And so I think we want to think as we're saying those goals, is this something that's, that's actually achievable? Is it one we want to accomplish? Because I will say too, goals are powerful. Um, when, when we set goals, that we have a, a way of moving toward them. So we want to make sure we're setting the right goal. And then is it relevant? Does it fit into the big picture? Is it really an important goal? And is it timely? You know, what's the time horizon we're talking about? Uh, so I think all of those things help us develop goals that are useful uh, for us going forward. And that's going to be really important as we get into how to get a plan to achieve those goals. So the second part of this or the next part of this that I'll uh, speak to a little bit too is um, thinking a little bit about the kinds of goals that we might want to set for our operation. And we've outlined um, three key areas. And I think um, this is helpful because it helps us think about, um, I mean, what the types of goals we're missing or the types of goals um, that we want to we want to put into place. So the first area here that I want to talk about is long-term versus short-term goals. Typically speaking, those long-term goals are more strategic in nature. Um, they're more of this big picture. They might tie in with our values. Um, and so they, and they might transcend generations. And so these are very important to, to maybe a starting point. We might start with those, um, but they're very important to, again, get those as close to a smart goal and as specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and relevant and timely as possible. And then the next layer here are short-term goals and short-term goals are, often built around key business metrics or key business functions. And they oftentimes support our efforts towards those strategic or long-term goals. Another area uh, to think about are uh, goals in built around the areas of our business. And so uh, think about your business plan and how you've broken down your business plan or the different areas of your business uh, that you're, you're, your revenues or your expense categories, but you can also think about, you know, production-based goals. Maybe you have a yield goal. Maybe you have a revenue goal uh, on a per head or per acre basis. Maybe you have goals around um, your calving program or your feedlot rates of gains. You know, those are very common. In fact, you know, we probably are very quick to um, come up with these around, especially around yield, right? Everyone thinks about yield really quickly. The next area are maybe marketing goals. Uh, what kind of marketing plan do we have? What are the goals that are associated with this plan, both short-term and long-term? Another area are financial or capital goals. Uh, thinking about the balance sheet, you know, a lot of benchmarking actually takes place around the balance sheet. And then, uh, so that's one area, maybe you have a capital CapEx plan, CapEx goals that you wanna achieve. And then you can also work this all the way down into labor or risk management plans. And as you can see, this could continue to, to go as your business, uh, as it fits your business. And the third area here are outcome versus input goals. A lot of times we think about outcome-based goals, such as a yield goal would be an output-based goal. Or, uh, for example, I want to achieve $100,000 in family living uh, that I can then use to, to support my family. That's an outcome goal. And the, that goal itself isn't one that we have a lot of control over. So in often cases, we need to put input goals around that or underneath it, nested as part of it to help us achieve that. So if you have an income a farm family living goal, you can start to think about, okay, what is it that I can do? That's a goal that I can accomplish in the next month or the next year that's going to help me achieve that outcome goal. 
David, you and I talk about this a lot, just personally, you know, a blank piece of paper is often the hardest, hardest thing to overcome. And it can be really intimidating. But one of the things you can do is, you know, take out five blank pieces of paper and write production at the top of one marketing at the top of another finance, labor, etc. all the areas you want to have goals, and then just start just start working toward developing some goals in each one of those areas and thinking about, okay, is this the goal? And then kind of ask yourself the why question several times and the how question, how are we going to achieve it to help start build that plan to implement and achieve your goals? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think a lot of times, um, we need to draft these goals. We need to sort of work with them, set with them and, and get off that, that top dead center, which is off in the blank page. On the next piece here, we want to talk a little bit about a few examples of how uh, goals might play out in your conversations or in your farm. And the goal for this uh, first example is to illustrate how goals will vary across operations. And so something that seems sort of um easy for someone to think about is maybe the next generation. That's something that a lot of us are going to face. Uh, and so it might seem like, oh, we could go to a web page and we can download a list of goals for an operation that wants to transition to the next uh, generation. And I just want to spend just a couple minutes working through this flow chart to show how it's going to quickly evolve and change based on your operations needs. So if we go to the left here, there's one question here is, uh, are you retiring soon or to the right? Are you going to be co-managing this operation with the next generation for a while? And as you can see, as Brent mentioned, said, ask the how and the why question several times to get down, uh, drill this down a little bit. If you're retiring soon, a few key considerations might be around transferring assets or the transitioning of that decision-making process. So as underneath there, you could start to think about all the different types of goals that you might have to uh, build that help you have a successful transfer of assets and help you have a tra successful transitioning of decision-making. And as you can imagine, uh, your farm and your situation has a unique set of assets and you have a unique uh, set of uh, decision-making processes. And the next generation has a unique set of transitioning decision-making uh, decision making attributes. So as you can see, this becomes very specific to your operation. It becomes very personal and it can become very uncomfortable very quickly. And so something that even seems high level, like transition plans can become very, very um, specific very quickly. And we have to be willing to, to go into that. On the other side, if you want to you know, co-manage this, maybe you have a goals around how are you going to share responsibilities? How are you going to grow the business? What are those business growth goals? Um, do you want to expand the current operation or are you going to spin out a, a different little entity or a different little uh, business model or a different revenue stream to help you make progress towards those goals? And so, uh, Spend some time thinking about this and how um, your goals could be very unique and very specific to your situation, how that can actually change over time. But you just need to be very careful to not uh, carbon copy somebody else's goals for their transition plan or uh, let somebody else tell you exactly how they did it because it's going to be unique to your operation. The second example here I want to spend just a few minutes with is uh, something that Brent and I think a lot about as economists and uh, people who spend a lot of time on budgets is how we can transition a, a goal and actually start to put it in our budgets. So the goal here is improving the balance sheet position by increasing working capital by $200,000 in three years. And we had a previous two economists and a lender uh, session where we talked about working capital. And one of the things we talked about is, you know, uh, thinking about goals to how you could build that. So we want to spend a little bit of time thinking about this from the goal perspective. And one of the first things you can think about is we talked about in the smart uh, elements of this, is it timely? Is it uh, achievable? Well, how feasible is this? And if we have good sets of historic uh, budget performance or return performance, if we have a good set of budgets available for 2022, we can start to pencil this in. Okay. Uh, how feasible is it to me to increase my working capital by $100 per acre per year over a three-year process? And if that doesn't necessarily fit in right away to your budgets, you can start to think about, okay, what are some of the trade-offs that I could make? Uh, maybe I'm going to hold back on family living a little bit. Maybe I'm going to defer some capital purchases. Uh, maybe I want to uh, revisit some of my other goals that I have. How do I want to make sure that uh, I can make progress towards this. The second piece here is an idea that Brent and I refer to as know your cost. Everyone says producers need to know their costs, but in a lot of ways, there are different 
uh, cost measures. So there can be economic costs, there can be cash flow break evens. And this other cost category will challenge you to think about is what's your break even cost for your goals? And so if you have a goal to increase working capital by $100 per acre per year for the next three years, pencil that in to your budgets. And what's really interesting and really powerful in your decision making process is in maybe a year like 2021 or 2022 when commodity prices are favorable and there's a, a profitable uh, cash flow opportunity out there. It, it takes some of the, the angst around marketing your grain whenever you're trying to figure out, well, is it going to go higher from here? Well, if you have those goals penciled into a budget, you can now step back and say, okay, yes, I can make a little bit of a profit here and I can make a lot of progress towards these goals that I'm building out. And you might find a year like 2021, you can make two or three years worth of progress towards some of these goals. And that's a really powerful way for you to think about it. And finally, uh, what goals can be added to keep us on track? A lot of cases, um, this top goal that I mentioned, it's going to start to, uh, you're going to start thinking about new goals that you can layer in underneath. So I, I like to say goals beget goals, right? So this idea of when you start with a good goal, you're going to continue to find other goals that are going to help you move towards that along the way. So to wrap this section up before we get to our lender expert grant this month, I want to share a few uh, final thoughts here. The first one Brent and I have for you is to start simple. A lot of times when we talk about knowing your cost of production or knowing your farm machinery cost, this idea is how do you go from zero to 60? And, and the way you do that is you make slow increments. I think one of the intimidating parts about setting goals is uh, you quickly step back and say, oh my gosh, like these are goals that are going to take me forever to get to, or I don't have enough information to know if this goal is attainable or realistic. And the idea here is to start simple. Uh, Rome wasn't built in a day. And so we need to make sure that we can just get on that, pro on that process, get started, and we can improve our process over time. As Brent likes to remind me, don't let uh, great be the enemy of good, right? We want to make sure that we are making progress and we don't get uh, overwhelmed by uh, the the best case scenario, the where we the aspirational parts of this, where we could be 10 or 15 years from now. Second point is don't let others define your goals and don't let your business goals define you and your family. It's really important that these uh, goals that you put together, you recognize that everybody around the table is going to have different personal goals. And you need to recognize where there's maybe a disconnect or where there's overlap or where there's some uh, gaps in between there. And second of all, we want to make sure that everyone understands the business goals uh, and, and that they all are relevant and they match up. There's some alignment between those business goals and their personal goals. And I think, you know, as I mentioned before, one of the more dangerous things is just to hear somebody else share their goals at the coffee shop or at a presentation or at a, a you know, a, a conference and you take their goals and adopt them for your own. That, that could be a recipe for challenges because as Brent said, uh, goals have a way we sort of move towards those goals and we end up, might end up moving in a direction that we don't want to go. And finally, point three here is how will you share your goals? This is actually a conversation that um, as we were preparing this, we spent a lot of time scratching our heads a little about this. Um, sharing your goals is really powerful. It can help build accountability. Uh, you can unlock some really powerful discussions. You know, chance favors the prepared mind. Um, so if you're able to share your goals, maybe your lender or maybe your neighbor or maybe a, a stakeholder in your operation can help you uh, think about an opportunity or a challenge or a hurdle that can be really powerful. But we also got to think about the role of trust and um, what are some reasons why you wouldn't want to share goals? Uh, what are some of the goals that you're comfortable sharing? And maybe what are some of the goals that you're uncomfortable sharing? And I think that's a really important uh, thing to, to at least consider at the outset. And yeah, David, I think uh, to kind of summarize all that, I, I, I always think back to that stupid movie Groundhog Day and the, and the lead character always going to the psychiatrist and always telling him, you know, take baby steps. And uh baby steps are really powerful uh, because you, they get you started. And too often, uh, we didn't want to show you all these big implementation schemes today because it can be really intimidating. And, and I saw somebody talk about their business uh, a couple months ago, and he talked about their, their planning process and their goal setting and all this kind of stuff. And, and my thought was, man, that's really intimidating. And it's intimidating because these they're so far down the path and you, it's hard to see how you can get from where you are to the end point, but it's a process. And, and I guarantee if you do this, uh, 
it will have a, you know, start setting goals, work toward implementing, it will have a profound impact on your business. I just am super confident that this is one of the things you can do that will really uh, improve your business in the long run. Like David said, don't let great be the enemy of good. So there are three um, ideas or resources here that we will share. And if you, as you go down that journey, as Brent talked about, is uh, taking good and getting better over time. Uh, three ideas to think about. One of them is anti-goals. And I find it personally um, interesting to say, it's hard for me to define what this goal is, but I know what I don't want to be, right? Maybe I don't ever want to raise livestock, or maybe I don't ever want to do custom hire. Maybe I don't ever want to raise dry land corn. Well, if you start with some anti-goals, you can put some things into place to help you stay away from these areas that you don't want to end up. Uh, Another area is the balanced scorecard. I know um, there's a lot of resources around there that you can look up and and incorporate as you work to improve. And finally, a book that we'll mention is Scaling Up. It can definitely help you uh, think about alignment between those long-term goals and those actions that you're doing on a regular basis. So at this point, we're going to introduce our lender expert, Grant Dixon. Uh, he has been a really instrumental as we prepared for this. So Grant, it's great to have you joining us today. Uh, thank you so much for uh, all your help along the way and for helping us out today. You're going to stick around for the overtime, so make sure everybody gets those overtime questions around goals and planning, but also um, you know anything else that's on your mind this month. So Grant, to kick this off, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a great opportunity here to be able to share uh, some of my knowledge and, and what I've learned over the past uh, 14 years here. So um, grew up in southwest Nebraska uh, near a little town called Juanita. Um, went to Fort Hay State University, got my bachelor's in ag business there. And after that, I had um, interned a couple of summers for Farm Credit Services of America, uh, once as an ag direct intern and um, once as a financial officer intern in Lincoln. And uh, after that, had an opportunity to move to Harlan, Iowa. Uh, Started my career there as a financial officer. Um, Was there eight years, met a a lot of great people, Um, was able to help a lot of operations grow and achieve their goals. And uh, about six years ago, had the opportunity to move home here. So moved back to McCook um, is where we live now. Um, uh, So I work with uh, a lot of producers here in the Southwest Nebraska area um, and lived here with my family, my wife, Amanda, and three kids, Jason, Kenna, and Henley, and uh, involved in production agriculture on a daily basis with my dad, um, raised corn and wheat, and uh, I have a small cow herd myself, so uh, stay pretty busy. I think it's your uh, diversity in both uh, geography, but also uh, the demographics that you've uh, covered in your career and, and your, even your personal life mm-hmm. makes this conversation really valuable. So I want to kick this off by revisiting the smart goal ideas that Brent uh, walked us through. I'm curious, what have you seen that producers typically struggle with the most? Um, you guys have done a pretty good job hammering at home, but it starts small. It's kind of the, the theory of how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time, that kind of kind of theory, I think. A lot of producers struggle with knowing where to even start. It's just intimidating to know how big a goal is to set for yourself or how broad you need to do um, to set those goals. Um, the attainable piece, that one's probably one that sticks out to me the most. When you set goals, you don't want to short yourself, obviously, um, and make them too easy. But at the same time, you don't want to set a goal that isn't achievable either. Um, you know, being the, the broad geography that I've worked across, you know, if you're out here in Southwest Nebraska and you set a goal to raise 130 bushel dry land corn, it might be attainable, but it might be something that's pretty tough for you to reach. So you don't want to get frustrated with goals that you can't achieve and get burnt out that way. So that would be a little bit of, of advice I would give is to, to make sure you start small and, and, and attainable. So oftentimes we associate uh goals with growth, maybe growth in our business. And, and you challenge us to think a little bit more broadly than just growth related goals. So can you explain that just a little bit? Yeah, right. The first thing when when everybody thinks about when you talk about goals is like growth and getting bigger and and all that. So, um, you know, you've heard the the quote before, sometimes better is better before bigger is better. So what areas can you focus on in your operation that you can get better at? Um, Ultimately, your goal might be growth, at the end of the day, but what are the smaller goals that you should work on to help yourself attain that growth? 
you know, maybe you need to focus on a goal that's around profitability or understanding your cost of production or, um, you know, finding people on your team or, or um, uh, that, that can help you out, I guess, into achieving those goals. You just, you want to make sure that you have the right people in the right places in, in achieving those goals. And, and like you said, some of, everybody's in a different stage in their operation. If you're young and beginning, your, your goal might be growth. If you're towards the end of the road and, and your goal is transition to the fam, uh, the next generation and the family, you're, you're, everybody's goals are going to be quite a bit different. So um, it's not just always about growth and you just have to make sure that you're, you're headed the, the right direction. Can there be such a thing as a bad goal? Uh, the ones that you don't pursue, <laughs> those are, <laughs> yeah, that, that's a bad goal is one that you set and then you don't work towards, I think. But um, there again, it just depends on the situation and where you're at um, in life and what you want to accomplish. You know, I don't, I don't think that there are any bad goals. I think there's probably just poorly defined goals. So um, you just want to make sure, I guess, that um, the goals are relevant to you. You know, that's part of the smart goals is, are they relevant? Um, if it doesn't fit you, don't, don't, don't put it into, and try and put it into action. You know, just like going to a, you hear a speaker or someone talk about their goals, that might not be the ones that you need to take home and put into, into action. So you just want to make sure that they, they fit. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about some of the risks associated with the goals that we're pursuing, or maybe some of the roadblocks that could stand in our way and how you've had conversation with producers to help unlock um, those insights. Yeah. One of the risks I think is you want to make sure that your family and that your stakeholders um, that are involved in your operation, that they're all on board or that they aren't adversely affected. Um, you know, your goals might not line up with everybody else that's on your team. So you want to make sure that, um, you, you communicate that with them and that everyone's on the same page. Um, you know, jokingly, I might say, well, you're, you're, uh, you might have goals that um, your, your lender might be able to help you um, achieve, but maybe it might affect another stakeholder down the, down the road. It might cause troubles in other areas of your business. So um, you just want to make sure that everybody's on board and that you communicate your goals and, and visit with the people that are affected and make sure that they're on board too. And if they're not, then you should make adjustments and, and plan accordingly. So, In preparing this, you shared a, an example of a conversation you had with a, a farm team. Can you elaborate a little bit on that today? Yeah. Um, so it's all about communication, right? You want to make sure that you, you're open and communicate with everyone that's involved. It's, it's kind of like walking into the, the dealership and the salesman tries to sell you this blaze red Corvette, right? When all you actually need is a three-quarter ton work pickup. <laughs> You want to communicate to them what your needs are. Um, so I always, I guess the communication part where I'm going with that is um, I had an example here a while back I was standing in a farm shop with a father and a son operation. And the dad was asked, the father was asking me about um, life insurance and whether or not he needed it or whether I thought that maybe it was a good a idea. And I said, well, you've got to tell me more about where you're going with this or why you think it's important. And he said, well, I guess while we're all standing here, we might as well just get it out in the open and talk about it. So um, we ended up having a pretty good conversation that, um, about the, the transition and the estate planning and how it was going to affect the sun and how things were, were going to set up, be set up. And prior to that time, th that conversation between the father and the son hadn't happened. Um, so I would assume that the, the son is guessing on how the operation is going to transition to him and the father's doing the same. So I guess at the end of the day, I ended up being the catalyst or the conduit that, that made that, that conversation come alive. And, and I think at the end of the day, everyone felt better that we all knew um, where we were, where the operation was headed in the future and, and how it was all going to play out. So yeah, that was kind of fun to be able to, to help them um, communicate and to be able to, uh, I guess, tell, tell what each party was, excited about for the future and what, where they wanted to get to with their goals. So, well, well I we think, were all yeah, Jason or Grant, I think that's a really important part of that communication. And that's, you know, sometimes a process of, of developing the goals can be just as valuable as the actual goals, because at least a whole lot of communication and discussion of, of, of what, you know, everybody wants out of a situation. Well, Grant, I know you have one last answer for us before we kick it back to Carly. So what's your piece of advice that you give to producers here in March, 2022, put on the billboard? Yeah, um, I guess 
my uh, my billboard would be to allocate time to invest in yourself. Um, I think it's very important to spend time and set aside time to work on this stuff because we all get busy. We, uh, you know, spring's coming. There's a lot of stuff going on. We've got all this, this checklist of things that we have to accomplish. But if you don't spend time on personal development and setting that time aside and allocating that, there's going to be a lot of other priorities that run over the top of your goals and um, what you need to do to focus on achieving them to have success in the future. So I think it's, it's all about allocating time for yourself. Find a way to do that. Put it on your calendar, set yourself a reminder, whatever it looks like, but spend time on yourself. Well said, Grant. Thank you so much. Look forward to you to stick around in overtime. I have, I have one here. Uh, says, uh, I have, uh, I've already developed, I feel like I've developed a lot of goals, uh, but I'm having a hard time seeing the connection between actions and the goals. What do I do? And I think that's a pretty um, good question. And it's, I think, something that a lot of people struggle with a lot. Uh, when I was a professor uh, and I taught strategic management, one of the things I spent a lot of time on was uh, implementation of goals. And, and one of the reasons is because I thought that was a huge um, gap in, in what happens from classroom to implementation. And so uh, I think we've all probably been through some kind of a strategic planning process somewhere uh, in an organization, whether it be our farm or a community organization or whatever, and we've all been frustrated by uh, the outcome of that process and felt like it was a gigantic waste of time. Be, uh, be comforted to the fact that you haven't worked at the university and could see just how badly that can happen and how bad it can get. We'd spend months writing strategic plans never to see anything come of it. And so the, the system I liked was something called the balanced scorecard and what it does, and you can Google that. It will um, it'll help you start with a goal and then drive down to action. So say you have, as David said, an output goal. I want to um, it hit, you know, this many bushels per acre. Well, then what are all the actions that you have to do in order to make it? And you start developing plans based upon that. Maybe I have to achieve planning by a certain date and I have to have this quality of a stand. And how do I get this quality of stand? Well, I have, you know, I don't want my employees, you know, planning it over a certain miles per hour. And I want them checking this, you know, there's all these kinds of things you can, can do, but it's a super powerful framework. And I highly recommend it for the people who really want to dig into that. Um, I see another question. I don't know if any of you guys wanted to add anything to that. Um, another question, given all the uncertainty with the Ukrainian war, what do you think we should be thinking about in our operations? And that's, that's a super good question too. Um, David and I have talked about this a lot. And one of the things that we have concluded, uh, in our minds is that, the range of potential outcomes is very, very wide here. And right now, um, the situation is very favorable for grain production and grain producers. And I think um, as we think about it, we have, to, we have to realize that, do something to take advantage of some of that, but also realize that um, things could get a lot better. Uh, if we don't have a good crop in the United States this year, prices are going to be much, much higher. On the other hand, uh, things could get a lot, lot worse. And, uh, and, and so, you know, there's increasing tensions with China and other things. And, you know, to the extent that um, times are really good now, things could go such that they become not so good. Uh, really fast. And so I think that opens up a huge uh, range of risk for us to think about. And so I think as risk managers, we really need to be thinking about what we're doing to manage the risk associated with growing what will for all intents and purposes be the most expensive crop any of us have ever uh, grown in our careers. Brent, to build off uh, what you mentioned about um, bad things or good outcomes and bad outcomes, Keep in mind, 
two years ago, oil traded negative in April of 2020. And everyone was wondering, will ag commodity prices follow, um, follow energy down? And now we've flipped the script, right? Energy prices is now headed towards, you know, you can pick up the paper and find $200 a barrel any day of the week that someone is on the, on there talking about that. So recognizing how quickly things have changed and could change moving forward, I think is, is really important. The second piece here that I'll add is there has been the uncertainty around how the war will unfold. And then there's the uncertainty around how the sanctions will unfold and how those will uh, adjust over time. And now we have this third and fourth level of uncertainty where what's going to happen with respect to domestic policy around ethanol or CRP or crop production. I think the takeaway here is we can't um, build a marketing plan around guessing what the third or fourth or fifth order impacts will be as to all this unfolds. There's, it's almost impossible. It's always difficult to outsmart the market. Uh, now it's just going to be completely impossible because all of these things, energy prices, grain prices, sanctions, uh, currency flows, all of this is intertwined in ways where we can almost guarantee, be guaranteed to not be able to accurately predict the outcome. Uh, and so how we need to make decisions in light of that is just go back to the basics, focus on base hits. Let's not try to outsmart the market, hit a home run. Let's just focus on base hits and, uh, and make good decisions based on the information that we have today, and then update our thinking with new, any new relevant information that unfolds in the next few weeks or months or the rest of the year. And I think David, that's one of the hardest things is that we are exposed to a torrent of information today. And there is so much information coming at us and it's available to us kind of instantly on Twitter and other things. But I think it's really important to step back from that information every now and then and ask yourself, is that good information? Is that viable information? How confident am I that that information is accurate? And I think if you really push yourself on a lot of the things that we see, you find that you're being exposed to a lot of information that is, you know, not that accurate. And not that true and it really in, in, in either direction and it can really mess with your decision making and i think it's really important so i'll tell you one practical thing i've done is uh i put a time limit on my uh twitter you can do it right there and in, in your iphone and you can set it and uh it's pretty surprising how rapidly you can burn through that yeah but it's really good discipline i think and i feel um, more confident and more um, uh, better about the decisions I'm making, I think, than I, than I did when you're just constantly um, reading about all the bad things going on in the world. Uh, David, anything, I see the question, anything you're thinking about that we're not hearing about uh, today or what's on your mind that maybe is not kind of in the mainstream of things? I think it's a great question. Um, it's kind of dangerous to ask an economist. There's lots of things that we that keep us awake at night. So you have to be careful what, uh, what you wish for there. Um, but I've been thinking about long-term interest rates. I think we've been hyper-focused on uh, the Fed's next decision and what the Fed's going to do, what they did at this month's uh, meeting, what they're going to do at the next month's uh, or the next meeting that they have. And if you just step back and watch some of these long-term rates, like the 10-year treasury, they've been trending higher. And and they went up before the Fed raised rates, and they continued higher after the Fed raised rates. And I think that potentially has um, big implications for agriculture, and not just on the cost of borrowing money, but on asset values, both in agriculture and outside of agriculture. And so I think um, there's been a lot of it. I think... There's been a lot of attention on interest rates, but I think maybe that attention isn't necessarily placed in the right in the right way in the right place. And you know, Brent, you and I mentioned this a lot. Um, these implications um, are probably you know two to five year implications, and not necessarily 2022 implications. But we have to watch how 2022 unfolds because that's going to set the pace for how this plays out uh, for the next five ten years. 
one thing I've been thinking about a lot, and it's it's just something that's on my mind, and it, it's it's something I think about, but it's not that actionable. It just concerns me is the the uh, proclivity in times of rapid change for bad policy to get developed and discussed and implemented, and. David, you were the first person that told me about it, and we wrote a little article about it um, uh, when inflation really started picking up. There's like a host of things people come up with to we'll stop inflation. Well, we should do price controls, or we should do rationing or other things. They're really bad, bad ideas, but it, it always tends to rear its head as these things start to unfold. And I think we're seeing it in agriculture today, too. Uh, oh, we need to repeal the RFS, or we need to open the RFS, or we need to open the CRP to cropping. Or, I mean, these are bad ideas, and um, unfortunately, they get more debate than they deserve. But I'm, I'm just con- cons- very confident those are bad ideas. Okay, so what should farmers watch and plan for po- with the possibility of stagflation or inflation as things continue to evolve? Great question. Um, just as a definitional thing, stagflation is this idea that we end up with relatively high rates of inflation, uh, low economic growth, and usually high levels of unemployment. Um, at least the last time it happened, that's what we got. And so you get in a situation where you have less than full unemployment. The Fed usually wants to lower interest rates to help solve that problem. But they're stuck because we got a lot of high inflation when the answer for that is higher interest rates. So you're kind of, you know, get yourself in a corner where there's not a lot uh, the Fed can do about it. Right now, uh, we have the high inflation. Uh, We have really low unemployment. And so um, I don't think we're there yet. Uh, It appears we might be going there. Certainly, um, with the spike in energy prices and it's an external spike. And again, last time we had this situation, we had the Arab oil embargo kind of got things going, but the chain of events associated with that lasted for a long time. And I think right now, everybody is watching kind of the war on Ukraine unfold on their smartphone and thinking it's like a movie and it's gonna be over soon. And um, we need to realize that the timeline for these kinds of things might be much longer than many of us are are willing to uh, want to contemplate. So I think how how stagflation plays out. What do you do? Well, I, th- I think at the end of the day, um, I go back to the lesson we learned at the end of our podcast, escaping 1980. We have we're supposed to write lessons to ourselves. And the lesson I wrote back to myself was the idea of don't uh, get overextended on financial leverage and do not um, try and act as counter cyclical as possible. So what that's saying is there's a great temptation when things are inflating to really jump in and, and go and push your bets into the middle of the table, for instance, on land and other things. And that can work, uh, but it can also put you in a risky position. So I think the key thing is understand what your goals are, where you want to be, right? So we focus our business on making decisions that move us towards our goals and not trying to out guess what the economic environment might do. So to answer your question, I would say uh, be conservative, but focus on your goals and your business plans and try and tune it out as much as you can. Uh, but be aware that this is probably going to last for a while. Um, Another question, um, how will inflation impact asset values? Is it good? Is it bad? What's the deal? As an economist, um, we generally dislike lots of inflation. And part of the problem with inflation is it changes prices rapidly. It makes people speed up economic behavior, and it tends to be self-reinforcing. And that, and that's a, that's a problem in that, you know, I always said, you know, Milton Friedman was made famous by saying inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, meaning it's all about the money supply. Um, 
and he's kind of right, but he's also um, making a little bit simpler than we might, than maybe uh, needs to be, that it's a human condition. And as humans start to believe inflation is, exists, um, it cycles. And so we want, we do more and more. It gets us into kind of an erratic behavior. And the only way to stop it is to break that cycle and breaking that cycle is very painful. So the last time that cycle got broke was in the 1980s. Uh, and it took a massive recession to, to do it and really high interest rates in a massive recession. So, um, is inflation good? Well, for farmland values right now, they're going up and they're driven in part by um, very high rates of inflation and relatively low interest rates. I think, Brent, to add to that is one of the reasons why we had this webinar two months ago talking about you know what drives farmland values. And one of them is the expectation of earnings and then also um, the interest rate environment. And so we have low interest rates. And so people are willing to bid of high value for assets to get those future earnings and the earning expectations are really high. So inflation could really impact how we think those future earning streams are going to look like. Um, but we also got to think about what happens on the other side of inflation. And that could be very painful uh, to, to think through and navigate. So um, I'm always, I guess, we hear farmland is a good hedge for uh, inflation. We hear that, I guess, that heuristic or that rule of thumb thrown out a lot. I think we just have to be uh, careful with how we uh, execute that and how we use that uh, more broadly. Carly, I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, Grant, thank you very much. It's good to have a fellow Southwestern Nebraska person on the program. I enjoyed it and learned a lot from you. I appreciate you taking the time to share with us. Yep. Hi, thanks for the opportunity. It's been great to share and I was excited for the opportunity and it, it turned out well. So thanks for having me and appreciate that. Yep. And that'll do it for another episode of Two Economists and a Lender. Thank you, David, Brent, Grant for leading today's conversation. And for you in the audience, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you online again next month.